Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide a smooth recording. If you have te technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our upcoming webinars are on March 27th, Locate Your Ancestors' Graves Online with James Tanner, and that'll be Friday at 4 p.m., as well as on April 3rd, German Periodicals with Larry Jensen, Friday at 4 p.m. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please vi visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from Bonnie Belza, who will be giving a pre presentation on DNA Kindergarten. And this is part three of her four part series. And there are four handouts available for this webinar and they're available at our website, which I posted a link to in the chat box. Bonnie Belza is a family historian and genetic genealogy DNA researcher whose degree in gerontology led her to genealogy research. She has attended I4GG, the International Genetic, genetic Genealogy Conference, Roots Tech, SLIG, and many national and local conferences, and is a frequent lecturer. She teaches the DNA kindergarten class at the 500 plus member West Valley Genealogical Society in Arizona, and presents on DNA genealogy with a focus on learning how to use, how to make DNA fun. If Bonnie is ready, we'll turn the time over to her. All right, let's get started here. Well, we've covered a lot in the last couple of lessons, and now it's time to put the pieces together that we have learned about in the last couple of lessons. But before we do that, let's take a review for those of you who may not have been able to see um, the first lesson, and let me see how I can get my going. There we go. All right, so let's review lesson one. Um, in lesson one, we covered DNA science, and the important things from lesson one is that we covered how DNA is shared with our matches and our relatives, and we introduced this handout, which is available under lesson one, which is called the Shared Centimorgan Chart. It was developed by, by Blaine Bettinger. Using this chart, you can identify the potential relationships that you have to your DNA match based on the amount of DNA that you share. And this is also a um, interactive sh uh, chart that you can use on a website called dnapainter.com. One of the things that we did in lesson one was we filled out this worksheet. It's called the autosomal or ATDNA inheritance in, uh, worksheet. And we had you enter in the relationship to each of the people in the blank boxes, the percentage of DNA that you share with them, and the average amount of DNA that you would share with those people. You might wanna take a screenshot of this so that you'll have the answers to that worksheet. In lesson two, we covered the subject of ethnicity, which means when you talk about your ethnicity, that you have a certain percentage of DNA in common with the native people of a particular geographic area. We talked about the different reference panels that the DNA testing companies use, which create differences in your ethnicity results across the different companies. And we looked at those differences by looking at matches in all four countries that I had and the differences that came up in the ethnicity reported by them. The lesson two handouts included a list of books that you might want to get um, buy or, or get for yourself um, that are related to DNA genealogy. There was also a worksheet for identifying your grandparents as far back as you can in your trees. 
and to make a list of the different surnames, including those maiden names of your grandmothers and great grandmothers. The other handout from lesson two was an acronym worksheet. That is a list of terminology and their abbreviated forms. Here's the answer sheet for that acronym worksheet. And you might wanna take a shot of this screen so that you have the answers from lesson two. All right, if you've got those answers copied, now we'll move on. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about some ground rules for dealing with your DNA. And one of the hands out is a list of the different rules that you can remember and practice when you're doing genetic genealogy. We'll also be talking about securing your DNA data. And I'll introduce you to the designated beneficiary form and the informed consent form. To be serious for a moment, the number one rule in genetic genealogy is to be sure you're prepared to know what you don't know. Everyone gets excited about taking a DNA test and finding out what their ethnicity is and maybe finding out some new cousins. But many, many times, people will find out things that they did not expect. One of the frequent occurrences is what's called misattributed parentage, or MPE. And that's when a parent is not who you think they were. That is, the people that raised you may not be your biological parents. The term non-paternal event is also used to refer to these findings. While there's no widespread consensus, the rate per generation of these occurrences is somewhere between 2% and as high as 10% of the time there is misattributed parentage. I myself have discovered unknown relatives in my own family that were a shock to some people, and other people did not want to really accept those findings. I've also worked with people who were surprised to find half-siblings or other unknown relationships. So if you haven't taken a DNA test, remember rule number one and be prepared to know what you don't know. I wanted to go through some of these genetic genealogy DNA rules that are in the handout. Aside from the one we just mentioned, some of the things we've learned so far in this series is that we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. That means we have a total of 46. Our autosomal DNA tests, such as those we do at Ancestry, MyHeritage, 23andMe, and a company called Living DNA, test those 23 numbered chromosomes. This autosomal DNA test can generally be traced back five to six generations. As we mentioned in our first lesson, we inherit half of our DNA from each parent, but our siblings and us will not share exactly the same DNA because we inherit different halves of our parents' DNA. Only males carry the Y chromosome, which is found on the 23rd chromosome, and only males can do tests for Y-DNA. Those tests are performed at family tree DNA. Both males and females can test for mitochondrial DNA, but only females pass it on to their children. And again, the mitochondrial DNA test is done at family tree DNA. Chromosome 23 is where the XX or XY chromosomes are found. Males get one X chromosome from their mother, while females have two X chromosomes, one from each of their parents. We talk about our DNA in terms of how many pieces we share, and those pieces are called centimorgans, and each DNA company will tell you how many centimorgans you share with one of your matches. 
each individual has about 7,000 centimorgans, or roughly 3,500 from each one of your parents. And as we go back in generations, the number and amount of centimorgans that you share with someone is roughly halved. So 3,500 with your parents, 1,750 with your grandparents, and so forth. And lastly, 99.99% of the time, DNA does not lie. One of the instances where you'll find exceptions to DNA is if someone has had a bone marrow transplant, not the kind that you might have for some teeth work, but for more serious um, illnesses. And for a time, that will alter your DNA. So as I said, there are those rare exceptions. Most of the time, DNA does not lie. Your DNA is uniquely you. And just like your grandpa's gold watch or your string of pearls, you want to keep your DNA safe and you want to make it available to the future generations. So now we're going to talk about securing your DNA data. What we're going to explain is how you download it from the different DNA sites and save it to your computer or a flash drive. The first step is to download it from the DNA testing company. So you'll need to sign in to the testing company account you created. Then you'll need to navigate to their DNA download page. Thirdly, you'll need to verify your identity when you request to download your DNA. And usually you'll receive an email that you'll need to respond to. And then you'll be given permission to actually download your DNA file to your computer. So this is a picture of Ancestry's download page. You find it under the DNA results summary, and in the upper right-hand corner is a little gear that says settings. When you click on the settings button, you'll scroll down until you see download raw data. When you click on it, as I said, you'll be set a email and you'll have, well, first you'll have to enter your account password and agree with their terms on understanding what you're doing with the downloaded data. You're not deleting it from Ancestry. You're just getting a copy of that raw data. Once you complete that, you'll be sent an email and you'll click on the link in the email to come back to this page and click on the download raw DNA data. If you're not familiar with the idea of downloading, what it's doing is taking the file or the information that is on the company's website and adding that file across the internet to your computer. Normally it will go to a folder called your download file on your computer. So pay attention when that download happens. A little pop-up may appear in the left-hand corner of your PC or, or Apple um, that shows you where that file was saved. Here's a picture of 23andMe's download. To get to their location for doing this, um, you want to copy this URL that's shown. They've moved the page around, so there's not a direct link but you can also find it on their site by doing a search for download. Again, you'll scroll down on the page to submit a request and you'll click on that submit request button. You'll respond to the email that you received from 23andMe and then you'll be able to click on the button that allows you to download your data. Your test results at Family Tree DNA may be because you did a test directly with Family Tree DNA, or you may have transferred your raw data from 23andMe or Ancestry into Family Tree DNA. And we'll talk a bit more about that later in the program. Family Tree DNA allows you to download your raw data regardless of the source. 
So it's recommended that you download the raw data if you test it at Family Tree DNA from Family Tree DNA. If you test it elsewhere, it's also recommended to download from those other sites rather than downloading a transferred file. This picture of Family Tree DNA's download location is on their home page. And you can see, we have a pop up down in the right hand corner. When you click on the term data download, you'll again go through the process of receiving an email, responding to it, and being able to return to Family Tree DNA and download your results. MyHeritage is another place where you may have tested. If you click on the three buttons, also called a hamburger, um, you will see a pop-up that will show you the choice of download. Same process, respond to the email, and download your data to a secure place on your computer. Now that you've downloaded your raw data and saved a copy of it in a secure place, what's next? One thing I recommend, just like you would with grandpa's gold watch or your pearls, is that you actually put a flash drive with this raw DNA in your safe deposit bag or some other secure place. Again, this is uniquely you and you wanna preserve a copy of it for future generations. Speaking of your future generations, you'll want to identify a beneficiary, someone who can take responsibility for your DNA results and your accounts that you have to access those results. This form by Blaine Bettinger is available at his website. And it's, um, it's not an official legal form. You might want to review it with your own attorney, but it does allow you between yourself and a designated person to share permission for them to have access to your data. And it also gives you the ability to fill out in that box in the middle, the name of the companies where you may have tested, and most importantly, your username and or email address and password. So if something should happen to you, the people in your family can get to your accounts and complete the information that they may need on those accounts. I've heard that in order to get access to something like your ancestry account, you actually have to submit a death certificate, which can cost your family members. So it's a good idea to do one of these. Whenever I travel, and um, I was gone to Alaska for um, three or four months a couple of years ago, I filled out one of these forms and left it with my children at home. That way, if something were to happen to me, they could access my accounts. A second thing that we do with our DNA, if we're not comfortable with exploring it and analyzing our matches, you can often work with someone who has a little more experience. Conversely, you might be the person with the expertise and you're asking someone to share their data with you so you can help them understand it. This informed consent agreement form, also prepared by Blaine, specifies what you as the DNA tester or you as the DNA analyzer are allowing each other to do. You wanna go through this carefully with someone. Um, it gives people the right to say that, I do wanna access my test results. So if you bought a test for someone and you've had it, the results showing up say in Ancestry or MyHeritage, it may be under an account that you control. If they indicate that they want to be able to access it, then you have to be able to give them access to their DNA. Keep in mind, regardless of who buys the test, the DNA belongs to the person who took the test. Another caveat for those of us who might be grandparents, it is illegal to test your grandchildren. 
only parents can test their children. And then there are some restrictions on testing children, which you can read about at the different sites. For the most part, it's not a good idea to test someone younger. You always want to try and test the oldest person in your family first. Some of the other permissions on here is allowing someone to use a alias, or they might want to use their real name on their DNA results. You as the analyzer might find some unexpected results on the DNA. And someone may indicate that they don't want you to tell them about those, or they may want you to share them with you. Another thing that we do when analyzing DNA, as I mentioned earlier, is we can transfer it from one company to another. And the person has to give you explicit permission to do that before you can do those transfers or limit it to particular companies. You can also decide to transfer the DNA to places like GEDmatch, which is an aggregate site for people to share their DNA information. And you wanna have the permission of the individual to share it at those sites. Something that's not shown on this form, which you may also want to discuss and make a decision about, is whether or not to make your information available for law enforcement. Let's talk a little bit about those DNA transfers, actually using this raw data that you've downloaded. Transfers allow you to expand a pool of potential matches. Because you're going to transfer your data to another DNA company and match the people that may be in their database. It also, in transferring your DNA, gives you access to tools that may not be available at the place where you first tested, such as a chromosome browser, which allows you to look at the pieces of the chromosomes that you share specifically with each one of your matches. I like to think of it as a buy two and get six deal. You can buy DNA testing from all of these six companies, except for GEDmatch, which as I said earlier, is an aggregator. But you only really need to buy tests from Ancestry and 23andMe. Why is that? Because Ancestry and 23andMe do not allow you to upload the results from the other companies into their databases. But you can take Ancestry and or 23andMe results and upload them to the other four. So you can take your Ancestry raw data, upload it to GEDmatch, Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, and Living DNA, and get more matches. So let's go through the steps of uploading your raw data. You'll need to create an account or register at each one of the sites where you want to upload your data. You'll need to accept their terms and conditions. And then you'll need to navigate to their upload instructions. Most of them are a simple click here, identify the file that you have downloaded from Ancestry or 23andMe, and then click upload. What does upload mean? It means you're going to take that file from your personal files on your device, either your computer or a flash drive, and you're going to have it transferred via the internet to their website. So you've downloaded it from one place and uploaded it to another place. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, DNA testing, you want to get fishing in as many ponds as possible. Ancestry is just one of the companies doing DNA testing, but they're the largest. As shown in this chart, maintained by Leah Larkin, who has the dnageek.com blog and website, Ancestry has exceeded um, 16 million tests. It said 
that anyone of Western European descent in the United States who are not recent immigrants, that means immigrants no further back, uh, I mean, yes, no further back than your grandparents, are already in the database, whether you've tested or not, because your relatives hit the tipping point and your DNA is represented by some of these millions of people that have already tested. You can see here that 23 and me have hit over 10 million tests. So they're the second largest. My heritage was last reported at about 3.77 million and family tree DNA at almost one and a half million. JetMatch had a million active cases, but today only about 200,000 of those are flagged to be used for law enforcement with the permission of the people who submitted their DNA to JetMatch. Living DNA is not shown. They're a rather new company. Um, they show great promise, but at this point don't have the volume of tests. So now you've taken your DNA, you've downloaded it to secure it, and you've uploaded it to get more matches. You get more matches because not everyone tests at the same company. So what do I do with all these matches? This screen is showing you a shot of the list of matches at the different DNA testing companies. So on the upper left is a list of GEDmatch people that match me. GEDmatch shows me how much, like all the companies do, Denimorgans I share with each one of these people. It tells me what date the comparison was done, and it tells me where they transferred their test from. The second one on the left is from Family Tree DNA. Family Tree DNA's match page will allow you to divide your paternal and maternal side if you have a parent or even someone as distant as a third cousin identified in your tree at Family Tree DNA. And then they'll divide your matches up into your paternal and maternal side. They also show you whether someone is an X match. And on the far right, if the person's entered it in, you'll see a list of surnames that that person has identified as being in their family tree. The bottom left corner is from 23andMe. 23andMe shows you the amount of shared DNA as a percentage on their main page. If you open the individual's profile, you'll see not only the percentage, but the amount of shared centimorgan. You can enter either a percentage or the amount into DNA Painter to see what the potential relationships are with that individual. The upper right is a picture of ancestry. You'll notice that all the sites give us clues about our matches before we even dig into their information. They're all telling us whether the person is a male or a female. They all try and give us a hint as to what type of relationship we might have with this match. I do recommend that you enter the number of centimorgans into DNA Painter and use their estimates as opposed to those shown at the companies. I recommend that because DNA Painter has a larger, broader mix of DNA results. And they also will give you all the different options for a relationship where the companies try and give you something close, particularly when you get beyond um, father, mother, son, daughter, sister, brother. The DNA companies kind of fall down in terms of breaking out cousins, nieces, and half relationships. So you'll want to use DNA Painter. The last box on the right is from MyHeritage. And MyHeritage offers um, ability to put notes on each one of your 
um, DNA matches, as does Ancestry. And you can see those notes in the list of information. They tell us the gender and the amount of shared DNA and the predicted relationship. If the person has a tree, it'll also give you a potential relationship between you and that person based on your compared trees. One of the first things that we learn in genealogy is to maintain a research law. How many times have you gone searching for someone on Family Search or one of the other genealogy sites looking for censuses, looking for birth certificates, marriage certificates, and death certificates, merrily downloading copies or adding them to your tree, and then four months later, had no idea where that information came from. Just like with genealogy, we want to track your matches and the information about those matches. It can be something as simple as a Word document where you just keep a running story of what you were doing when you were researching that match. Because you'll find thousands of different matches, I suggest having a match research log. Your match research log will keep track of who the person is, where you found them, that is, which testing company, and what you found out about them. You'll find yourself adding information about a person over time as you dig deeper and deeper into your potential relationships. I'll mention here that there are a lot of DNA tools available that have been developed by some very smart programming people who have a, a great talent in analyzing information and providing tools that make it easier for those of us not so talented to manipulate our data. Those are a bit of a more advanced class, but if you're interested, you can search um, a Facebook group called Genetic Genealogy Tips and Techniques for a description of some of these tools. They allow you to consolidate your matches from all the different companies and then um, analyze it in a, one big group. You will find people who've tested in more than one place, and you'll be able to get information from each place about that person. This is an example of a match research log. Some of you who, like myself, may be old time genealogy researchers, remember doing family group sheets or doing pedigree charts on paper. And that may be something you're still comfortable with. You're going to need to get to use the internet in order to analyze your matches, but it might be more familiar and helpful to transcribe the information that you find to a form. You can also use this form as a Word document and complete it for your matches as you're doing your research. I find it useful to keep track of their name and age, where they located, usually where they were born, um, how many centimorgans they share with me, and potentially how many segments they share. Whether or not they're an X match to me is something that I'll record. If I'm lucky enough to find their phone number and their email, I'll put those on this form. And I like to keep track of the name of their tree or a URL that points me to their tree and their ethnicity results. I also, using DNA Painter, will put in the amount of shared centimorgans and then list out the potential relationships that are predicted between me and the match. I can then cross out those relationships that are highly unlikely because of my age and the match's age and narrow down the possible relationship between me and a DNA match. Another tool that you might want to use for match tracking is a spreadsheet, something like Excel or Google Sheets or Apple Numbers. Here's an example of a spreadsheet that I keep where I have the name of the match and sometimes a column separately for their username where I got the information from, in this case, it Joe's from Ancestry, 
the number of centimorgans they share with me, and the name of their tree, if they have one. I make a list of the surnames that that person has in their tree. So in Sally's case, she has the Elko surname and the Kittle surname. And then I make a note of the potential relationships between me and the match. This helps me because I can sort in these Excel spreadsheets by the amount of shared centimorgans, by the tree names, by the surnames, or by the potential relationship. I find myself putting a lot of information into these spreadsheets, so I have a quick reference to the matches that I've been working on. So how do we research a match? Well, the first thing we're trying to figure out is where does this person fit in my tree? The potential relationships give us a clue. If someone is your first cousin once removed, you want to look at your tree, identify where a first cousin once removed would be in that tree, and then see if that match would fit in that spot. One of the other things that's often easier to do is identify the side of a tree that your match is on. When you look at the matches that you and the match share, you can oftentimes identify whether they're on your maternal side or your paternal side. You also ask yourself, what do I know about this person? As the different websites where the DNA companies give us a list of matches to go, you can identify whether they're male or female. Oftentimes, you can look at their profiles and determine their age, their surnames. You might be able to see their tree and identify their ancestors. I often find it's very useful, if I can't find something out about someone, to Google them. They'll turn up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We can all identify with being genealogists in going out and snooping where we need to to find someone that we want to put into our tree. You want to use the tools that we've talked about in this series so far. The Shared Centimorgan Project Predictions Chart is going to help you identify where the person fits in the tree and, it, and also what type of relationship you might have with that person. If you've built out your grandparent and surname chart worksheet, you'll be familiar with the surnames in your own family. Sometimes, beyond our grandparents, those names don't come right to mind, and it's good to have that list as a reference. You'll also be using your own family tree, and you'll continue to expand it as you add matches, which will introduce more names, more surnames, more relationships. As you're expanding your tree and using these tools, we do something with DNA genealogy that is verboten when you're talking about doing real genealogy. A serious genealogist is very careful to cite and source all the information that they have so that they can come up to a hypothesis that can be proven. We're chasing DNA. And once we have identified where we think the DNA came from, then we can go back and complete it in a proper genealogical fashion. So you want to be accurate, for example, try and get birth, marriage, and death information on the people that you're searching in the trees of your matches. But you don't have to be as exacting as you would be in doing regular genealogy. You're on the trail. You'll go back and categorize those people and complete the information on them when you've gotten to the end of the trail. For that reason, I recommend that if you have an extensive genealogical tree that you've worked on, make a copy of it and do your DNA in, a, in that copied tree. Then once you've concluded where the person fits and you have the evidence to support that, 
you can add them to your genealogical tree. The most important thing, if you're going to get something accomplished, is to focus. It's so easy to go down those rabbit holes just because, oh, wow, that person looks interesting. Or you find a newspaper article. And then three hours later, you're no further along in identifying your match, but you've read a lot of interesting articles. I'm sure you've all been there. So you want to focus. And the way I do that is to take a yellow sticky note and write, what am I researching? Who am I trying to find? And keep checking back to see that my research blog and the information that I'm pursuing is answering and focused on that particular question. One of the things that's a very big challenge when researching our matches is finding their trees. Now, in some of the DNA testing companies' sites, the match will be linked to their DNA by their tree. Ancestry has this feature. However, a lot of people, because they took the DNA test and never, ever had done a family tree, will either not have a tree or only have a private tree, or they might have a very bare bones tree. Some of the sites don't provide a way for a person to easily add tree information and so it'll be missing. Your job as a genealogist is to research the match and other genealogy sites to build a tree for that match and see where it connects with your tree. Family Search and Wikitree are free sites for researching trees of people. Both of them provide a one world tree, that is, the tree is everyone who has entered into it. There is no Johnson tree or Smith tree. It's just one big family tree. Ancestry and MyHeritage allow you to have your own private tree and you can access those trees from your Ancestry account or your MyHeritage account. Be prepared, however, to have to pay to play. One of the things that the DNA testing companies do is get you to test your DNA, but to get access to your matches trees, you'll have to have a subscription. When you've done your initial research on a match at Ancestry or MyHeritage, I find it useful to pay for a three to six month subscription to be able to access those people's trees and then to let that subscription lapse when I'm no longer researching that man. You're going to have to use basic genealogy skills to build your matches trees. So what does it mean to build a tree? You're going to either build a pedigree as shown here, left to right, or you can also look at this as a descendancy tree from the oldest ancestor coming forward. All of the sites allow you to build a tree. And what they allow you to do is to add your parents or the match's parents, and going back in time, add grandparents, siblings, cousins, etc. You can do this at all the websites and build a tree for yourself or for your matches. You can also use software programs offline, like Roots Magic, Family Tree DNA, I'm sorry, Family Tree Maker, Legacy, and the one for Mac, Reunion. There are other programs as well that allow you to add parents and other relatives and hook them together, as shown in the diagram, so that you can track their relationships. Sometimes you may have a tree and you want to be able to add new people. Again, 
the different testing companies allow you to add people to the trees as you discover new relationships. Ancestry and MyHeritage both have the ability, as well as family tree DNA, to copy people from other people's trees and incorporate them into your DNA genealogy working tree. You can search for people and find out their relationships and add that information to your tree. There's also the ability to import a tree. Just as we downloaded our DNA and uploaded it to the websites, we can also download a copy of our tree and import it and upload it to the websites. So we'll go into a little bit more of uploading and downloading trees in a future lesson. There are some rules when you're building your tree. You always want to add a first and a last name. If you don't know the surname, leave it blank. Don't put in the word unknown. That confuses the computers. Always, always use the maiden name for females. Your grandma is not Mrs. Smith. Your grandma had a maiden name. If you don't know it, leave it blank. Otherwise, use the maiden name for females. I suggest putting your dates in as DD for the date, as 21 for today. The month name, I put in MAR for March, and a four-digit year. A standard way of entering the dates helps in providing consistency in your tree. Often when you try to enter a city, county, state, and country to a tree to show where someone was born or married or died, the software or the website will suggest standard city, county, state, and country names. Use these standard suggestions. It helps in linking your tree to the trees of others. I also suggest that you avoid using periods as in JR period and avoid using those titles like Mr. or Reverend. Those are just additional information that's not needed at the top level. You can always add a fact to a person's profile to indicate what titles they may have held or that the fact that they were a junior or a senior. Always remember to add supporting sources for your facts of birth, marriage, and death if you can find them. This will be a paper trail back to your match when you think that you've identified where they belong in your tree. So just like any puzzle that you may have done, you want to group similar pieces together. You know how when you start out working on a 5,000 piece puzzle, you go for all the edges first and try and get the outline. Think of this as trying to identify the most recent common ancestor for you and your match. You often also have a copy of what the finished puzzle is supposed to look like. So it's a good idea to think of working on your matches as looking for the bigger picture. picture. What shared matches group together and which relative do they point to? I often tell people that DNA is like working a 5,000 piece puzzle. The only problem is all the pieces are the same shape and there's the same picture on both sides. It's a challenge, but I think it's one that you'll enjoy as you practice using your tools from DNA Kindergarten. This webinar series started out with season lesson one, which was an intro and a covering of DNA science. Lesson two, which talked about ethnicity. This lesson, which talked about how to use your DNA. Lesson four, we'll talk about interpreting your shared matches to break down brick walls and verify your family tree. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can reach me at bonnie.belza 
at gmail.com. That concludes this lesson. And Brian, I'll turn it back to you to see what questions we have. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, we'll now take questions from the audience. If anyone has any questions, please post them in the chat box and Bonnie can answer them for us. I know we covered quite a bit today um, and it's some things to think about. Um, if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and um, enter them in the chat box. Oh, come on, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to click on your microphone first to be able to ask a question. Well, okay. All right, I don't think we've got too many. Uh, I think they're all pondering it today, Brian. Yeah, that's that's probably it. Or is it a really great presentation and nobody has any questions because of that? <laughs> All Thank right. You, well, we'd just like to thank everyone for joining us today and remind everyone that we do have a webinar next week um, on Friday at 4 p.m. Um, that's March 27th, and that is Locate Your Ancestors' Graves Online with James Tanner. And also Bonnie's next part, like she mentioned earlier, is going to be on that Saturday, so March 28th, and that will be also at 4 p.m. Um, and so we hope that you can join us next time as well. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email us at FHL underscore webinars at byu.edu. Um, yep. Thanks for joining us and hope you have a great day. <laughs>